God's good. Amen. I'm very thankful that uh, we've got a piano player that I can just, when we were going to sing something else, and I said, let's sing this one. So I'm guessing she knew what we were doing. She played it just right, didn't she? So uh, praise the Lord. Listen, you think sometimes people say, well, you know, it's, uh, number one, it's not easy to play the piano at all if you've ever tried it. And you've got to read two different sets of notes and try to get your hands doing all kinds of things. Uh, that's not easy. And then if you've ever tried to, I could only imagine uh, trying to play with some people singing. Because uh, what she'll do is follow the singer. And so sometimes when you're singing, people will listen to the piano player. And she's slowing down because they're slowing down. They're going, oh, I need to slow down. They slow down. She has to slow down. It's a big mess. So I'll say this, whenever you're singing, just sing, and she, she'll keep up with you. And uh, I'm thankful for that. Appreciate all of our musicians. It's good to see the orchestra growing there, and, and uh, we need some clarinets in there and a tuba. A tuba would be good. So if you can play the tuba, let me know. We'll get you in there. Proverbs 30 tonight, please. Proverbs number 30. I want to begin verse number 15. Now, uh, it's interesting, the Bible said the horse leech hath two daughters crying, give, give. And there are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not, it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith it is enough. Verse 17, the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. And so I found it interesting uh, as I was studying this, uh, talking about uh, uh, this creature called the horse leech. And I read up on that and studied it, and it says here these four unquenchable things have something in common with this creature. And the horse leech saps its victim of, of life. And so... Uh, in other words, it, it saps things but gives nothing in return. And as you study about the horse leech, it lurked in ponds and streams and waters waiting for its victim. And as the horse would drink, the horse leech would fasten itself on the horse's lip or nostril, crawl inside, grow and cause obstruction and bleeding. I don't know about you, I don't want that, right? And so another name for this creature is a vampire. And so think of this, Satan... And that's what he desires. And we see that picture that in our lives, the Bible says this, that, that Satan's desire is to kill and destroy. That he's as a roaring lion seeking about whom he may devour. And it's amazing that I was talking with a preacher today how we as Christians have so allowed him in our world, in our lives, and then when he destroys, we can't understand it, right? We, we want to play with fire, but then when we get burned, we don't understand why we get burned. And we look to God and say, well, I'm one of your kids, and I can't believe you would allow this to happen. And so the warning we're getting here is that we have to be very careful. I'd say this, uh, uh, you better be careful where you stick your snout, right? You know, you know the old saying, keep your nose out of other people's business? I'd say be careful putting your nose anywhere it doesn't belong, right? And so the human race is legitimate prey to Satan. I mean, think about it this way. God loves you. God loves man. We're the apple of his eye. So Satan hates God and everything he stands for, and he hates holiness, and he hates righteousness, and he hates the long-suffering of God. And so his desire is to suck every bit of joy, peace, love, and holiness out of us. I mean, that's what he does, right? I mean, when you look at the average Christian, Brother Salazar mentioned it Sunday night, there's no joy, there's no peace, there's no happiness, and it's like serving God is a drudgery. And may I say this, if you really are born again you're really saved by the grace of God, then, then God imparts, implants His Holy Spirit in you. And there ought to be some desire for the things of God. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect, that we never sin. But Brother Shane, we, I don't have confidence, and I know I'm not the Holy Spirit, in someone who does not desire the things of God. 
again, some backslide, Brother Adam, some get out of the will of God, I understand that. But still, there ought to be a desire inside of us for the things of God. Well, I know this, that if, if, if God is doing something in my life, and we've heard it, you've heard it said this way, God's, God's uh, blessing, the devil's messing, right? I mean, anytime God's doing something, the devil's going to try to destroy it. And when God's doing something in your life, I promise you it won't be too long until Satan is trying to destroy it, not even really because he hates you, because he hates God. And so you and I, if we're aware of these things, if we're, if we're uh, aware of what Satan's trying to do, then uh, we ought to be able to uh, flee from it. So Satan's desires to suck every bit of joy out of you, and, and he's doing it. I mean, you look every time you turn on the news, it's, it's bad news. It's, it looks like there's nothing good happening. And then you get in the church, and everybody's complaining. And, you know, well, I've got all these trials. May I say this? And we've, we've done it several times, and I'll say it again. There's no one in here who's not going through some trials. So when you feel like you're the only one, right? And Remember Elijah when he had his pity party, and God, I'm the only one. And God told him, he said, look, I've got all these people over here still serving me. Amen. See, Satan will try to isolate you and make you feel like because of your trials, because of your situation, you're the only one, and because others... Uh, may not express it the way you do that, uh, that they're not going through trials in their life. Or here's my favorite, well, you just don't understand. Well, I may not, but God does. And so tonight in this scripture, Solomon or the, the, uh, the, the one writing the Proverbs shows when Satan is at work and he gives us a pattern of how he does it. And so give me, I'll give you four things tonight. How is it that these four unquenchable things in which Satan's trying to steal our joy, our peace, our love, and our holiness. Number one, he, he describes in, uh, in verse number 15 where things terminate. Notice the Bible said the horse leech hath two daughters crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not enough. The grave. Can I say this? We're all going to die. If the Lord doesn't come back, we're all going to die. And so why is it that, uh, that, that there's so much, uh, there's so much uh, uh, sadness and there's so much despair when it comes to that? Well, he's describing here where life terminates. In other words, it, 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 even with funerals. Now, I understand sometimes that someone who, is, uh, who dies and they're without Christ and, and uh, people are concerned about where they're spending eternity... But what amazes me is how many funerals I've been to or I've done where the person loves God and, and here has tried to, to raise a, a godly heritage and it's a war right. over possessions, Come on. Right. Over, over who gets to make decisions, right? Yeah. You would think this, this, at least this one time, people could learn to get along. You think this one time that, that folks that hate each other could say, we're going to put our differences aside for a little bit so that mom or grandma's funeral is not a disaster that we could honor them. But you know what? Satan doesn't care. He doesn't care. And, and may I say this? Why is that? Well, where life terminates and why it terminates is this, sin. I mean, I mean, when you think about it, there were no graves until Satan entered in the picture. There were no graves till Satan entered into the picture. He tempted Eve to doubt God's word. And he's doing the same thing to us today. Listen, if he can't destroy you with physical death and spiritual death, he'll steal the joy and the life out of your Christian walk and you'll just have a, have a dead, dead Christianity. And that's where a lot of Christians are. They have no joy. They have no life. They don't enjoy being saved. It's always a drudgery. It's always bad. And so he tempted Eve to doubt God's word. And he tempts us to doubt God's word. And, and to have life, you've got to have the bread of life. Right. To have true life, you've got to get your life from the word of God. And so we live in a day, let's be honest, most Christians don't read their Bible, don't, don't spend time studying the word of God. If you do, praise God. But here's what Satan will do. He'll, he'll, he'll cause the flesh to hate the very bread that gives us life. And when he does that, you know what happens? We die. 
We die internally. We, we don't enjoy being saved. We don't enjoy salvation. So she came and, and Adam came and sinned. It wasn't just Eve, by the way. It was Adam too. If you'll notice in the New Testament, you know who God blamed Adam? You say, well, that's not fair because Eve took, took the fruit. Well, Adam left her alone. Adam willfully took and did what, uh, and let me say this, he did what God told him not to do. And so fellas, may I say this tonight? Regardless of if your wife and your kids and everybody else turns away from God, you still have a responsibility to stay with God. Because you don't know down the road if you won't win them back for your faith. Well, you know what, now, I, I, I've seen men, they've left our church. Well, my wife doesn't want to come to church there. Okay, but is that where God wants you? Well, yeah, but, and you know what, Brother Johnny, several of them not even in church now. See, that sin causes death to fall on mankind, and sin in your life, even though you're saved by the grace of God, if you don't deal with it and confess it, You'll have a deadness inside of you. You'll have no desire for the things of God. Satan will rob you of your joy, your peace, your victory, and you will be a walking dead man spiritually because you have no joy in the things of God. And that's where most of Christianity is today. They could care less. You know, let me tell you why we don't have a Sunday morning crowd on Wednesday night? Because this is dead. I, I, listen, I, you know what? It, it gets dark early. Okay. Well, the kids got school. Do you realize, I, I know you do, but I want to make sure we're clear. Do you realize that for hundreds of years, kids have been going to school? Do you realize back in the early 1900s, kids went to school? 1940s, 1950s, when it seemed like God was really moving in the church, kids went to school. Do you realize that years ago, and, and how many of you remember this, that Sunday night, and Wednesday night were 7.30 services, right? And somebody said, we'll do 6 o'clock on Sunday. Maybe people start coming to church. The ones that thought, well, I can't go to church because my kids will be up too late. You know what they did? Well, you know what? My kids got to go to bed at 8 o'clock. So you have it at 5 o'clock. Guess what? Same people still ain't going to come. Right. has nothing to do with the time and kids going to school. It has to do with this. See, until you get to where you love the things of God and desire the things of God, you've got a dead Christianity. You say, well, you can't judge a man's Christianity on how many times he comes to church. No, you sure can't, but I'll say this. Uh, the fruit that you see, you judge a tree by its what? Fruit. And if you can't even come to church, I doubt very seriously you're spending a lot of time sp uh, reading the Bible Praying, spreading the word of God. Oh, preacher, you're judging. No, no, I'm not judging. But I do know this. Uh, Hebrews 10, 25, I think it is still in the Bible. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And the Bible said that we're doing it, do it more as we see the day approaching. Can we agree Jesus is coming back? We don't need to go church less. We need to go more. Amen. Well, I just don't feel like it on Wednesday night. Well, you think I do? See, Satan's still working through sin today. 6,000 years, he's been doing the same thing. And guess what? We still fall for it. Those horses, listen, they still go to the water. They still do the same thing, right? We're the same way. So, so sin and then separation, the grave, the grave, the barren womb. What's the grave? Well, the grave separates. Listen, I'm thankful that those that know Jesus, we know where they are. But can we agree that even though we know where they're at, it still hurts because we don't have them here? The grave separates us, doesn't it? At least for a little while. And may I say this, sin does the same thing. Sin separates families. Sin separates churches. Sin separates a nation. Sin separates us from God. We lose fellowship with Him. Sin is not good. No matter. Well, the devil. Listen, I understand the devil puts it out there and says, "Look how attractive it is." And the Bible even says it's pleasurable for a season. But when that season's over, you have to deal with the destruction of what that sin has done. So sin does the same thing. It separates. And Satan wants to separate us from the Father's fellowship. 
and protection. Do you know God doesn't owe us protection when we're outside of, uh, outside of his will, when we're sinning and living outside of the will of God? Now, I'm glad he's long-suffering and he still gives it to us. But listen, when, when, how many of you know this? Your kids get older and they don't want to listen. They want to do their own thing. You say, well, if you're going to live my house, my rules. By the way, that's a good policy to have. Well, my kid's 28 years old and still lives at home. I can't make them go to church. If you're paying the power bill, you can. Right? Now, while you're in my house, you're under my protection. But once you leave my house, I don't know where you're at. Now, I still pray for my kids when you... But the fact is, when you, when, when you step out and say, Daddy, I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. Well, that's what we do to God. Then when, then when Satan attacks us, we'll go, where are you at? Yeah. We're outside the fence of protection. Right? right? Yes, so there's that separation. Then he deals this in verse 16. He says, the grave and the barren womb. Well, what is that? That's where life originates. See, Satan's attacking on every front. And understand this, that when the Bible talks about the barren womb, in that day, the Bible said it was a reproach for a woman not to have children. There was was something about it that because every woman desired to have children in that day, and if she couldn't, many times they would say, well, she's cursed of God. There must be, she must have sinned, something's wrong, right? And and so think about this, to those who can't have children, it brings disappointment. We went through that. Man, we tried for several years to have kids and we didn't know why. We were living for God in church, doing the right things. And, you know, and I remember saying this. uh, I remember, Brother Jake, I said, God, I don't understand this. We're doing everything right. We're going to church. We're serving you. We're in the will of God. And and here you've got people that are uh, on drugs and could care less and aborting babies and giving them away and neglecting them and don't want them. And you're letting them have them. And here's a family that wants them that's going to raise them up in church and you won't give us one. Our hearts were broken. And so... When you think about this and look through the Old Testament patriarchs, how many of them were barren? Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel. Why? Because he tried to prevent the birth of Christ. Satan did everything he could to prevent the birth of Christ. And today, what's he doing in the church? He doesn't want to see people birthed into the church. He's doing everything he can to to poison the waters of people getting saved. And listen, how many times do we come to church and we bring that that grievous spirit in here and grieve God and and we come in and we don't have the right attitude and we've not spent time with God and we've not prayed and we come in with a bless me if you can and, and preacher, we spend all the time trying to get people to live right instead of the church going out and winning people to Christ. Listen, it ought to grieve us when people don't get saved. It ought to break our hearts when people aren't being born again. But Brother Jimmy, churches go years and years and years. Nobody gets saved. Nobody thinks. Listen, in in the biblical time, if a woman could not have a child, or especially if she desired not to have a child, there was something wrong. Now we live in a day, churches, they don't have children. They don't have people saved. And they're going, well, it's just the sign of the time. So you're telling me God's changed. Well, people are harder today. They don't want to hear the gospel. And I'm not going to be graphic. But do you realize what a miracle it is for a woman to be pregnant? Don't tell me about hard times, right? It's no harder today to win people as it ever has been. It's just the fact when you don't sow any seed, you can't expect any grass to come up. So he tried to prevent the birth of Christ, but he failed. He's trying to hinder the church, but he fails. Then also in where life originates, there was not only disappointment, there's defeat. 
Whenever the barren soul feels the need for change, Satan starts to work. How many times, let me ask you this, on a personal level, how many times have you sat in a service just like this and God convicts your heart and you go to the altar and say, God, I want to change. And before you even get to the car, Satan's already working to try to get you right back in doing the same thing you came down and said you want to get done with. Right? How many times have you got up and said, I want to start reading my Bible on Sunday morning. God, you've dealt with me about it, and I want to spend time with you in prayer and Bible study and fellowship. And Monday morning you get up and you're too tired or the phone rings or whatever it is. Satan is always trying to defeat us. And he uses everything he can. Every weapon he has at his disposal he uses. By the way, let me say this. He uses people. He uses our emotion. He uses our fi- he uses our mind, right? He uses our heart. Every weapon he has, he'll use. Brother Adam's like we don't even know. Well, I I didn't see that one coming. He he's he's not creative. Exactly, he doesn't need to be. He didn't have to come up with new ways. Because the old ways keep working. And all the way back in the Garden of Eden, you know what he said? God wouldn't kill you. God didn't really say that. Let me just change this just a little bit. Right? You know what he's doing today? Same thing. We sit in church, the Bible says, bam, 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 we go... I don't believe that's exactly what that says. He's using the same methods he's always used. And we're, you, know how you, you know how you know what methods they are? Right? You look, you look at the playbook. God's saying, look, here it is. I'm telling you what he's going to do. Uh, not today. I, listen, you know what? Today, Brother Jimmy, Satan's got all these tools. He's got Facebook, and he's got, he's got the transgender agenda, and he's got the government. He's, they're not new. That's right. Look at the Old Testament. Yes, sir. People are not doing anything different than they did in the Old Testament, Amen. Brother Foy. It's right. the same thing. Right. Can you believe all this sexual perversion that's going on? Have you read the Old Testament? I mean, did, did, did you, did you, do you think that God put in the law that you could be stoned for, for sleeping with your, with your father's uh, or for, with your son's wife? Yeah, think you just put that in there because, well, maybe one day in 2023 they're, so they're going to do it. They were doing it then. That's right. We're going, I, can you believe all the perversion that's going on today? It's, it's always been. And so we look at the defeat if he is unsuccessful, right? Satan's unsuccessful. He does all he can to defeat the new life. If he can't keep people from being saved, he defeats them after they're saved. There's no victory. How many of us, let's be honest, it's your, your Christian walk is this. Highs and lows, highs and lows. Man, when God's blessing and all these things going good, oh, God's so good. And then all of a sudden you hit a trial and it's like, oh, God, why me? Is he good or is he not? He's not good because he does good. He does good because he is good. See, we're, we're always, give me an example. Somebody asked me about Brother Shane. They said, can you tell me about Brother Shane Hatcher? Say, he's a good man. You know how I, why I think he's a good man? Because I've observed him and see him act in a certain way that would make me think he's a good man. Right, right. So I'm basing his character off of what I see. Well, he can, he can do good things and not be good. I mean, there, there are people that are lost that give more to charity and do more for the homeless than, than saved people do. But that doesn't mean they love Jesus. And so we equate God's goodness with what he does. If God blesses us with this, this, and this, we'll say, oh, God's good all the time, all the time. God's good. What most people mean by that is 
God's good when he's pouring stuff in my bucket. But God's good when he ain't pouring stuff in your bucket. But he pours stuff in your bucket because he is good. And it's like this. Well, you know, sinners are sinners because they sin. No, sinners sin because they're sinners. Whether or not they commit the big unpardonable sin or the wicked sin, that, they're a sinner, right? We're born into sin. That's why we do the things we do. But we're oriented in this mindset of, well, he does this, so that's what he is. So we look at God, and as long as God's doing what we think he ought to do, we say, oh, God's good, boy. Right. Oh, yeah. Brother Earl, he, he healed Brother Earl. God's good. What well, if he didn't? Because right. I'll be honest with you, when I, when I was praying for Larry Allen, Brother Eddie, I, I prayed just like this. God, you're going to do what you want to do, and I know that, and you're good either way. That's right. Right. But I know, I know that you've, You've healed the lame, made them walk. And I know that you've healed the sick. And I know you caused the blind eye to see. And what a, what a great testimony for here's a man that they've said is going to die. And now he doesn't die and you get the glory. Right. Well, guess what? God chose not to heal him that way but take him to heaven. Right. What well, does that mean God's not good? Uh-uh, he's still good. Right. See, you you got to... You've got to get off it because the devil will steal your joy and your peace when all you do is think God's good when he does good things for you. So there, there, where life originates, number three, where life operates. Well, notice this. The Bible said in verse 16, the grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water and the fire that saith not it is enough. Well, all that's good. But see, I got to get down here in my life. That's where life operates. In between death and birth is the life. In between on your tombstone, the day you were born, the day you die, there's a dash. That dash is your life. So if he's going to try to defeat me in birth and defeat me in death, guess what? All in that dash, he's going to do the same thing. Here's how, he do, here's how he does it. So the Bible said, the earth that is not filled with water. I'm going to get very deep and theological. If I'm, if I'm wrong, Brother Jimmy, if you have no water, zero water on the earth, what would the earth be? Dry. Right, if there's no, my yard is dry. It's Austin's fault because he put seed in my yard, right? I told a guy the other day, he said, man, it ain't rained forever. I said, it's my fault. He said, how's your fault? I said, I planted grass seed. If you want to rain, all I got to do is wash my truck, right? Well, if you don't have water, you have dryness. And so in order for things to live, they need water. I know, I know us as Baptists, we don't understand this, but you can go days without food. What, seven? Seven to ten days? Maybe longer than that? Two weeks? Watch this. As Brother Bobby will know, how long can you go without water? There you go. You can't go long without water. So, so when we think of this, in order for things to live, they need water. And the absence of water brings dryness. So if Satan can choke the living water from the believer, he can cause that, that dead, dry feeling in life. You know where you get your water from? This and your time, Brother Eddie, we sang about it. That time of prayer, when you don't have that, right? You're dry. That, that water, that moving water is a type of the Holy Spirit of God. And the way you get the Holy Spirit, the feeling of the Holy Spirit is fellowship with Him. See, you, you got to get some stuff out of your life. 
But then you've got to put some stuff in your life. And that, that's how you have the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And, and when you look at that, when we have that dryness, if Satan can choke that out, if, we can, if he can get us to where we don't come to church and we don't read our Bible and we don't pray and we don't spend time with other believers and we don't spend time with God, you know what happens? We get dry. Amen. And that, think about this. That's why you used to could sit in church and the choir would sing. And there'd be something swell up inside of you, right? And now you come to church and you sit like this. Right? Well, you know, that choir, they're just not as good as they used to be. No, you're not. Right? Well, that preaching... I'll tell you what, I just think the preacher, since, since he's preached through books of the Bible, he's been in Proverbs so long, I just get bored with it. Okay. You just told on yourself. You say, well, how can you say that, preacher? Because we're all made out of the same stuff. Brother Matt, I know when I'm walking with God, you can get up and start talking about the announcements, and I'll, start, I'll shout you down. Amen. I mean, when I'm walking with God, you can preach on anything, standards, you can preach on tithing, you can preach on the meat, you can preach the meanest message you've ever heard, and I'll be like, Amen. Amen. Right? But then when I'm not walking with God, man, you can talk about John 3 16 and preach on it and ooze God's love. We're going, man, I, I just I got nothing out of that. It's not the word. It's not the preaching. It's not the choir. It's not the Sunday school teacher. Listen to me. It's you. You're dry. You say, well, the preacher, how can you say that about me? Because it's evident. You, you, can tell, you can tell when something's dry, can't you? I mean, when something's dry, there's no growth. Stuff dies. You can see it on people. Brother Harlan, they, we blame it on everything else, right? It's my job, my family, my health, right? People don't treat me right. This isn't fair. You don't understand all I'm going through. I, I get all that. But what's that got to do with your dryness? Right. What you're saying is the only time you can, you can have any life is when everything's going good. And when you say that, you know what you just said? Satan. Here's my weakness. Right? You do realize this. Satan is not God. So he can't be everywhere at the same time. He can't be in here. When it comes out here, I wonder how many times if we just pray, right? Instead of making everything known to everybody. You know what you're doing? You're advertising. Not just to, not just to the world, to, to the demonic world. Let me, let me like, preach away. When you, he doesn't, he doesn't know what's here. But once it comes out, because here's the problem. We act like Satan is God. He's not. He doesn't know you like God knows you. He knows about you what you let him know about you. So when you verbalize it or when you type it out and you let everybody know what your weak spot is, you know what you're doing? There you go, Satan. That's right. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Here's my target. That's good. When you verbalize what... Your kids won't do. You know what you just did? Here's Satan. That's right. And put a target on their back. Amen. When you tell everybody what you won't do because you love Jesus so much, you know what you just did? Here's, here's, my, here's my source of pride that you can strike me at. I'm trying to help some of you because you... 
it's not just about, Brother Sean, it's not just about the whiny spirit that I see a lot of Christians have. Well, you know, I want everybody to know what's going on with me so they'll know how to pray. Okay, but how much of that is more sympathy than prayer? And how much of that is just opening it up? And then when, when Satan keeps shooting darts in there, we're going, I don't know what happened. I'm telling you what happened. You just announced to the demonic world right. what your weakness is. Good. So here's the thing. Just pray about it. Amen. Just pray. Oh, right? God. So there's a dryness. And then there's a destruction. Eventually, the dryness causes death. An emptiness that can never be quenched. And it destroys life because we're devoid of life-giving water. I mean, if, some, if, something's com, if, if somebody's laying here completely dead, you can pour all the water you want to on them. It ain't going to revive them. And that's where a lot of Christians get. Don't get to the place where you've lost all your joy, all your peace, all your hope, right? Because when you get to that place, there's not a revival, there's not a resuscitation that's going to take place. And then number four, quickly, where life perpetuates. Where it ends. Notice what the Bible said. It said, And the fire that saith not, it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat it. Where life perpetuates the eventual, eventual ooh, let me say, eventuality of it. In other words, things will eventually end in death of the physical body. We're all going to die. Right? Spiritually. You can cross over one of God's deadlines. His long suffering. The Bible said there is a sin unto death. What is it, preacher? Brother Adam, I don't know this the same for everybody. I don't know. But I do know this. That at some point in time, you can continue to say no to God. And God stops dealing with you. See, the long suffering of Christ will eventually end. Here's the other thing. And nobody preaches this anymore. I remember, listen, I remember growing up, I'd hear preachers like this, it scared me to death. <laughs> that you can sin to the point where you're such a reproach on the cause of Christ that he takes you out of here. You don't hear preaching like that anymore. You know why? Because it messes up with this hyper grace stuff right. Right. that God's just up there going no that's okay oh you're yeah. fine you're fine eventually listen to me young person it, happen, it can happen to you too well I'm young God's going no you name the name of Christ you say you're saved by the grace of God you are his ambassador you're his representative yes, sir. Amen. and God will not be mocked and he will not allow us to continually bring a reproach upon his name right. and not deal with it and he'll chastise us, and he'll, he'll lovingly chasten us, and he'll try to correct us back in. But it can come to a point where God said, that's enough. 100%. That's what the old-timers preached. You don't hear it now. You know why? Because it won't fill church pews. Buddy, I remember, Brother Brad, I remember hearing him preaching like that. I'd sit on that pew and go, oh, God, help me. Right? Because here's the other thing. There's an eternity. See, the desire and lust that we submit to here will go on for eternity if we don't turn to Christ. Hell's going to be awful, not just because of the fire, but because of the sin. Heaven's going to be sweet, not only because we're going to be with Jesus and be with our loved ones, but we're not going to have to deal with sin. I'm not, I'm not going to have to deal with my flesh anymore. There's some changeable things, but then there's some unchangeable things. There's some unquenchable things. 
So God warns us. Satan's after us. Satan wants to rob you of your joy. Satan wants to rob the lost man of eternal life. And what I'm afraid is he's winning. Now, I know eventually we win, Brother Jerry, no doubt. But there's a lot of defeated Christians because we will not accept the fact that Satan is our enemy. Amen. And he's doing everything he can to, to kill, steal, and destroy. Yes. He, doesn't care. he doesn't care that you're saving the independent Baptist in your church on Wednesday. He doesn't care. You're right. You're right. He's going to keep attacking. Doesn't matter if you're a preacher, he'll attack. Doesn't matter if you're a preacher's wife, preacher's kid, deacon, deacon's wife, deacon's kid. Doesn't matter if you've been faithful for 50 years. He doesn't care. That didn't impress him. He's after you. He'll do all he can to destroy. We're going to pray. Probably need to pray tonight for our, not just our young people, but for us. God would protect us from that. And again, after the service, after